Our reading from the scriptures is from Matthew's narrative of the gospel, chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Our text is found in verses 9 through 13. 9 through 13. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, wherefore, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise and walk but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Rise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it, fill it up, taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. While he spake these things unto them, Behold, there came a certain ruler, and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come, lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman that had diseased, was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said to them, Give place. For the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. We stop in our reading of the word of God at that point. 
praying, God blessed it, blessed it, blessing it to us. In verses 9 through 13, we have the text that God gives to us for tonight. In verse 1, we read that Jesus passed over the portion of the Sea of Galilee and came into his own city. After Jesus was rejected at Nazareth, and that's where he had been raised, and they wanted to push him off the cliff, and he passed through the midst of them, he made Capernaum the center of his labors. The Sermon on the Mount, which is recorded in Matthew's, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, so just prior to this incident, is located just to the north of where Capernaum was located on the very north part of the Sea of Galilee. So it was easy for him to go from Capernaum up into that mount, preached to the crowd there, came back down. And now it seems that when he passed forth from thence, verse 9 begins, Jesus was on a main thoroughfare out of Capernaum. And it was on that thoroughfare where there was this tax collector's booth. And Matthew was, or Levi, was occupying it. And that's when Jesus, much we may believe, not only to the surprise of the Pharisees, but even to the surprise of his disciples, stopped, looked into the booth, and said to Levi, Matthew, follow me. And he arose and left all and followed Jesus. That's what we want to consider tonight. We do it looking, first of all, at the call that Matthew received, Matthew's call, God's call of Matthew. Secondly, we consider the Pharisees' criticism of what Jesus did, particularly as Matthew celebrated that he was called. And then thirdly, we consider Jesus' explanation of his call of a Matthew by describing his work to be that of a merciful physician. Matthew's call, Pharisees' criticism, Jesus' mercy. About Matthew, or Levi, very little is known. There are three disciples, three of the twelve, of which the Bible gives no record that they spoke. Nothing that they said was recorded in the scriptures. Matthew was one of them. All the other nine have something that's recorded that they said. Matthew, being one of the least conspicuous, is nevertheless one whom God used to record a narrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his position as a tax collector, Jewish in nature, he had to not only know the Jewish Aramaic tongue, but he also had to know Greek. He was well versed, we know this, in the Old Testament scriptures. And so he had been trained as a good Jewish child in the synagogue, and likely Capernaum. If that wasn't where he was raised, it's where he now lives. And while again, there is no record of his contact with Jesus or knowledge of Jesus prior to this, Everyone who looks at this history believes that he knew about Jesus 
if he had not even heard some of his speeches. So when Jesus comes, Jesus is not totally unfamiliar to him. He knows him. Matthew has the occupation of being a publican. A publican is the name that the scriptures gave and they gave in that day to those men who were tax collectors for Rome, toll booths people. But they used their position in the employ of a hated oppressor. So not you didn't like tax collectors. They were people that you already despised just because they were in the employ of Rome. And what Rome represented to the Jews was disastrous to their identity as a nation. They hated anybody who worked for them, including the tax collectors. But the tax collectors were known, like Zacchaeus, another one, to have been very free to use their position to line their own pockets. So they always charged more, or often did, so that the whole group of tax collectors, publicans, were known to be pretty evil men that, you, that frustrated you because you couldn't do anything about it. If they laid a charge upon you, you had to pay it because you didn't know if it was accurate or not. And you feared what they might do if you wouldn't pay it or refused to pay it. If people of other countries hated tax collectors, the Jews even more. Now the phrase, publicans and sinners, is so common, even for you young people and children, that we know that the Jews put publicans, tax collectors, in the same group as sinners. Now that's interesting because the word that's translated sinners doesn't simply refer to somebody who sins, but it's a very strong word that speaks of someone who is devoted to sin. They are purposeful in their sinning. They're stained and easily identified as those who are doing what is wrong. So the Bible uses the word, and the Pharisees now make use of that word sinners, as a way to describe those who are especially wicked. Publicans, sinners. Jesus is moved by God to stop by the booth occupied by Matthew, Levi, and call him to follow him. He had done it with Peter and John, Andrew and James, Bartholomew and Nathaniel. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men, he had said to the two sets of brothers. And they left all and followed him. And now, he doesn't just take those that would be known as the unlearned, but he takes someone who's notoriously sinful. And he says to him, I call you to follow me. That word call. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That word call, well, the Bible uses the word call in two ways. It uses that uses the word for what we call what we identify as the external call. That's what goes forth from the preaching. 
and the internal call, which is the precise work of the Spirit communicating to those that God has elected and given a regenerated heart. And that call is, well, my sheep hear my voice. When Jesus admonishes, then the call means that we're pricked. When he proclaims the good news of his work, then that work, the effect of that speech of Jesus is that God's sheep are comforted and encouraged. When he says to the fishermen and to Matthew, follow me, that is an efficacious, always effective speech of Christ, of God through Christ, into the heart and mind and soul of one. Now, Jesus is going to broaden that out at the end of our consideration and at the end of this passage when he says, I call sinners to repentance. Here, he absolutely amazes his present disciples by saying, I want this notorious sinner to be one of my disciples, one of the twelve, one of the special ones who's going to follow me in the course of my ministry, hear my speeches, observe my miracles, watch my life, and later on, sit down and take the time by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to record. And to record it in a way that's aimed to the Pharisees, to the Jews. Luke wrote for the Greeks, Matthew was used to write to the Jews. And so if you have a, an edition of the Bible where the quotes from the Old Testament are highlighted in some way, you're going to find more of that in the gospel narrative of Matthew than you are in that of Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew was writing to the Jews who had the Old Testament scriptures. And Matthew writes his account about Christ, well-versed in those Old Testament scriptures, and bringing them in over and over so that these Jews could see that this one, Jesus, from Nazareth in Capernaum, is the Messiah that was promised long ago. By calling a notorious sinner, Jesus shuts the mouth of man's wisdom. He would be one of the last ones any one of us would have wanted to be a follower of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever spent some time thinking about who would be a good disciple. None of us would have put Matthew on the list. But Jesus calls him. And as 1 Corinthians 1 points out, God chooses, chooses the base things and the low things of this world to confound the wisdom of men. To make us realize we really don't know. We really don't. And then we look in a mirror of the law of God and we say, there's hope for me. If he can choose a Matthew, he can choose a Ron. And what he's doing is 
shouting. It's not works. It's not merit. It's not good enough. It's grace. It's the power of my love that goes to those who don't deserve it. That's the call of the gospel. Matthew's response, he left all. He walked right out of that booth. Makes us scratch our heads about whether he watched over the money that was gathered there. But the idea is that he, at that point, was no longer going to be a tax collector being a responsible child of God and disciple of Christ, he took care of that money and made sure that it went to the right party. But then he gave his letter of resignation immediately and said, I am no more in that occupation, no longer in that employ. I've got another one to follow. Again, because it's likely that he lived in Capernaum, he knew about Christ. And when Jesus stopped and said, follow me, just as Peter and Andrew, James and John had heard of him and knew about him, so Matthew did. And he immediately followed him. Surrendered everything that he was used to. He left all. To show his proper response he held a feast, a great feast, Luke's narrative of this account says. And he called everybody to his house. He took, the, he took Jesus and the other present disciples that he had, and, and he invited all kinds of other publicans, people that he knew, was acquainted with because of his occupation, those that he rubbed shoulders with in that employ, and he invited them. What he was doing was, one, honoring Jesus. He wanted Jesus to have the primary seat of honor in that feast. He was also demonstrating his gratitude and subsequent joy that he would be delivered from that, everything that that employment signified. He was called to repent. And that call was not just to work effectively in him so that he would say, I'm done with it, I'm sorry, forgive me. But the gift of repentance that came with that call is what brought him to know, I'm forgiven. Repentance. I'm going to change. I'm not going to do the same thing. I don't want to do the same thing over and over. It may have, it may have its claws in me in some form of addiction, some form of depravity so that it's so hard to break but repentance is I'm going to say no I'm going to leave it I'm going to hate it and I'm going to learn that that deliverance makes him worthy of all my gratitude so to honor Christ to show his gratitude at being delivered and saved and knowing salvation. And that's why Matthew said to all of his friends, his acquaintances, those who were in that same position, the ones he rubbed shoulders with, come, I want you to meet the one who has delivered me. I'm going to put him in front of you in a position of honor. And 
And then this. The Bible doesn't record it. But this has to have taken place in the soul of Matthew. Having tasted that deliverance. And knowing that it was but the grace of God that would bring him out of it. And give him deliverance. He prayed. Set them in the same room as the Savior. And now, Lord, if it be thy will, work. Work through the presence of Jesus into the hearts and souls of these fellow sinners so that they may know their sin and may want to flee it and repent. So it's not that Jesus was going to the bars and the taverns and going to the places where we would not want to be. Jesus wasn't seeking questionable company. Nor must we think and be made to think as some would have us that Jesus' presence among these other publicans tax collectors, is that he was approving of their sin. He was a guest. He was a guest with other guests. And he was invited specifically to communicate to those other guests that were invited to meet him. Matthew tasted what it was to be called by the power of the Holy Spirit. He repented. He left all. And he wanted to share the joy. It's likely that after the feast, when people were leaving the banquet, walking out of the house of Matthew, that the scribes and the Pharisees that were present watching these people leave used that as the occasion not to address Jesus, they've been stung enough by him, but rather to address their words of condemnation and criticism to the disciples. You are a follower of him? Ah. This is with whom he consorts? This is the people he likes to hang out with? Ah. And you want to follow him? That was the nature of their criticism. In doing that, the scribes and Pharisees misjudged the sinners, themselves, and Jesus. They misjudged the sinners. They looked at them as a class and in their minds, there was absolutely no hope. They looked at those publicans, those tax collectors, and they, quali they, they identified them with those sinners who were devoted to sinning. And they said of them and believed of them, they're going to hell. And they had already put them there. They didn't, it was impossible for them to conceive that a Matthew could be saved. Couldn't happen. And that's the way they classified them all. They misjudged themselves because they did the rather common, humanly normal way of judging. And that's this. How do I match up to them? So they judge themselves that way. How do I match? I'm better. I wouldn't do that. I would never work for Rome. I would never commit that sin. God forbid that I would ever be found over there sitting with those people in that kind of a room. I'm better.
let's realize that whenever we judge horizontally, whenever we compare ourselves to others, we for sure are always going to find people that are worse than we are. And we're going to leave thinking, see, I'm not so bad. <coughs> and we're going to misjudge, seriously misjudge ourselves. Don't compare yourself to others in order to find out who's the greater sinner or who's the lesser sinner. When they misjudged the sinners and themselves, they also misjudged Jesus. They took the simple association relationship that Jesus had and said he must be a friend of them, he must be a lover of them. And they condemned Christ on that account. Jesus' response, as it's recorded in verse 12, tells us how Jesus viewed the relationship, the, maybe a better word, the association that he had with the publicans and sinners. They were condemning Christ because of his, of his association with them. They took that to mean he agreed with them, and therefore he was identified with them, and therefore to be condemned to hell with them. Jesus said, my association with them in this room, in this banquet, is like that of a physician. Now, you identify these people to be sick and depraved. wouldn't you send him to the doctor? Well, that's what I am. I am a physician. They that are whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick, you call them sick? Well, that's exactly why they're next to me. So Jesus' identification of himself as the great physician, using the figure of a doctor, is that those are the that he is the kind to whom the sick will come. That was Matthew's thinking when he invited them. He just experienced deliverance from that lifestyle and all that it implied. And he wanted those caught in it to be delivered. So he brought them to have this kind of contact with Jesus. Jesus says, that's why Matthew brought them to me and had me invited to the same feast. That's my calling. How many of you love to go to the doctor? We even don't want to go just for annual checkups. If I can avoid him, good, that's better. But when we're sick, or our children are sick, that's when we immediately make a call. I need help. I need to be looked at. I need my child to be looked at. There's help. Please help. Quickly. When a woman early in her pregnancy or at any time in the pregnancy doesn't feel movement anymore. Tomorrow's too late to check. I want to go in tonight, today for an ultrasound. Jesus says, I am here as the physician 
to be recognized as the only one who can help sinners. You say they're sick. I too say they're sick. But I want them to know that they're sick. And I want my presence around them to show to them that they are in need of repentance and forgiveness. They're in need of repentance and forgiveness. I will get close to them who believe that they are sinners. Precisely to show them the way out. Now in contrast, sinners, not those who call themselves righteous, the spiritually healthy. I would never do that sin, and I would never live that way. I'm healthy. I'm healthy spiritually. Really? Do we want to say that? You know the huge difference between the identification of the marks of the true church and the spiritual condition of the members of that true church. To say that I am a part of a church that does one of the best jobs that I know of in reflecting the marks of the true church as God identifies them in the word. And the chief of them is that kind of preaching of the gospel which constantly calls sinners and shows them mercy. So to say, I am a part of a church that does one of the best jobs of reflecting the marks of the true church is a long ways from saying, and we're the best. We're a fool to think there's any equal sign precisely because the preaching of the gospel is that which shows us we're sinners. How can I be better? The reflection is going to be I'm the chief sinner. I can't be better because of that. I need that precisely because I'm a sinner. And I need to hear about God's mercy. I need to hear about the riches of His mercy. I need to hear about the greatness of His love that would reach down to such sinners as me. No one who identifies the church by the marks of the true church, of the three marks of the true church, may be able to say, and that makes the occupants and the members better. The Pharisees, judging horizontally, judge themselves to be the elite. Oh, you couldn't go to them and say, do you sin? And they would say yes. They weren't fools. Sure, they would say yes. But if you ask them the question, how do you rate over against so-and-so? They would have uh, picked up their shoulders and they would have said, 
I'm not quite that bad. That comparison, whenever we compare, we blind ourselves to our own sinfulness or the horribleness of our condition and the need for our constant activity of repenting. Constant, the need to constantly be repenting. But then, constantly hearing His grace is greater than all my sin. The blood of the cross, that perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness is granted and imputed unto me. So one of the most horrible effects of sin is that it blinds us. It's the gospel. It's the call to repentance that opens our eyes to the horrible reality of our natures and the horribleness of our individual violent violations of the person of our God. Matthew's call the Pharisees judgment Jesus mercy as only Jesus could do after he identified himself as the physician that sinners need. He looks at these teachers, these doctors of the law, these men who had skilled themselves in knowing the Old Testament scriptures. And we almost have to smile because he says to them, Go and learn. They were the ones who were the teachers. But he tells them, would you please study? And notice that he doesn't do here what he does elsewhere, Jesus, when he quotes the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah said, He knew that they knew Hosea 6.6. 6. He knew that they knew it was the prophecy of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. Where God says, I desired mercy, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. Do you know would you go and study what it means? I will have mercy, not sacrifice. I have to turn just two pages to go to the second time Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6 6 in Matthew 12, verse 9. I'm sorry, Matthew 12, verse 7. The importance of that thought of Hosea 6.6 6 cannot be underestimated. I would have mercy, not sacrifice. I would have the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. What's sacrifice and, the, and burnt offerings? That's the formal activity of going to church. Sitting in church for three hours every Sunday. That's sacrifice. That's burnt offerings. That's doing what they did in the Old Testament to worship God. That, we sit here. We, you ought to hear us sing. We pray. We get the Bible preached. We read the Bible. Man. God doesn't want that. He wants, and this is so interesting, he wants mercy. Now we would think 
that if he was going to say something, he was going to say, God wants a heart that loves and is devoted to God, that loves the Lord. Doesn't that flow from that parallel in Hosea 6, 6, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings? No, God. Listen. Listen to Jesus. He looks at these Pharisees who have only been partially critical of Jesus and the publicans and the sinners. And he says, God wants mercy. He wants you showing that you know what it is to be the recipient of mercy. Because when you know all that you've gotten is mercy, undeserved love and favor of God, then you're going to be merciful. But if you don't know you receive it, you're not going to show it. You're going to go through the formal activity and say, there, another Sunday done. I did it. God ought to be happy. Well, maybe we won't dare say that last. But our attitude shows that. Unless... We stand under the bright lights of His face. And first, those lights show the dirt. And we see the dirt. And we cry to the physician, heal, save, forgive. And the physician says, I have granted and imputed to you the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Jesus Christ. You're forgiven, child. Don't carry the thought of your sins of the past with you. They're gone. God does not hold it against you anymore. You're forgiven. Why? Because I'm not as... No, it has nothing to do with whether you're better than somebody else. It's simply mere grace. He chooses unbelievably to show His love to you. And you keep saying, I don't deserve it. He says, yes, you're right. You don't. And you never will. And even... This is amazing. Even when you get to heaven and we're praising Him, it's not our works, it's God's working through us so that when we get to heaven and we're able to praise Him to the best of our ability, we're still going to say, it's all what God worked in me. It's all what He gave me to do. So I don't deserve it. Even in heaven, I will not be earning anything of the favor of God. We get it just because He wants to. That's all. And then, that we get it, it's not only going to be that we love him, but we're going to love the neighbor. Not the ones we pick, but every single one that he puts in our path. And we're going to show it by showing mercy. Luke 6, verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. So the the Pharisees add to their sin by forbidding those who are sick to be healed. It is not just that they made their boast in outward worship but omitted that which was most pleasing, truly pleasing to God, but that those who know themselves to be in need of mercy and know that they are receiving mercy are going to be the ones who show mercy. That's what it takes to be a deacon. That's what it takes to be a child of God. That's going to be the fruit 
that salvation is going to work in us. Then, to explain that, for, because, I come, not to call those who look at themselves as better, but I come to those who know themselves to be sinners. And I don't just say, okay, now you better repent. I call them efficaciously to repentance. Now look up Acts 5, verse 31, and Acts 18, the passage, we, the verse that we referenced this morning. God came, Jesus is raised to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance and forgiveness. He gives forgiveness with repentance. It's all a gift. So when he calls the sinners to repentance, it's not he efficaciously works in them so they will say they're sorry. That's the first part. He also works in them efficaciously so they will see. I'm, I'm forgiven. I've got the righteousness, satisfaction, and holiness of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God just is pleased to give it to even me. Still. Amen. We thank and honor thee, Father, for this truth. Work the reality of this passage and its teachings in us that we may grasp it and appreciate that thou wouldst have us know thee and show that we know thee by loving mercy. For Jesus' sake, amen.